I was going down into my mother's food cellar where I could be, where I could hide and not be noticed. And I would experiment with my body because I found my body to be a sort of answer, a media, a vehicle to access the things inside me. I felt it was okay to use my body this way. The church had told me, uh, your body belongs to God and you shouldn't mess with it. And if you do mess with it, you need your parents' consent, you need your pastor's consent, uh, you need the consent of God. God owns your body. I had rejected that notion back there when I was wearing the robe and holding the Bible. It did not make sense to me. It didn't jive with the things that I had inside me when I was four or five years old and, and grew up with. So, in my mother's fruit cellar and in my mother's basement, I found close pins to be a very nice device to create sensation and to experiment with my body. So at an early age, while I was not in the robe in the choir loft of the Lutheran Church, I would be in the basement doing things like this, putting clothespins on my body. And I could do some of this in secret and private because I developed a hobby at this point in life. I became an amateur photographer. And I had to develop my film in a dark place with a locked door because if you opened the door, it would ruin the film. So not only did I have a great cover for when I needed a long period of time that I couldn't be disturbed, but I actually learned to do photographs. And so for the early years of my life, under extreme difficulty, because this was World War II and film was rationed, I did manage to take photographs periodically of these little body play things that I was doing. And of course, I got better and better at it. The right button here. And so finally I started to have more and more clothespins on me. By the way, there will be some slides in here with writing on it, and the writing will be backwards because the uh, projection system they have here is a backwards system. It, it's from the rear, okay? So bear with me. If you only read Danish, it won't be a problem. If you read English, it will be a little confusing. So my experiments uh, in secret continued. And they were inspired mainly because I was in this very dull community of farmers, basically, and Indians who were forced in to go to school with us. They were my friends, the American Indians. My inspiration came mainly not from uh, any uh, mass media movies or television. There wasn't any. It hadn't been invented yet. For It took 30 years before there was something like television. We did have movies, but very limited fare. Tom Mix and his cowboys or something. They were just out of the silent era. This was long ago. So back in this period, I was an avid reader, and the only place I could find out where people might possibly live differently than they did where I lived was in books. So I, I scoured the libraries, uh, I scoured the encyclopedias. In fact, I read all the, in my junior high school years, I read all the encyclopedias in the school. I started with volume A, I read all of volume A, then I read all of volume B, and all the way through Z. And when I got through with that encyclopedia, I went to the next one. And I found a lot of general information in there, and I found out then where to go to look for something that I really desperately wanted to find out about. And that was, how do other people live other than these people in this community under these social situations? So I found my inspiration in many, many places. One of the best was our National Geographic magazine in America, where I found pictures of people in other cultures doing things that intrigued me, that gave me some sense of thrill, that gave me some sense of in mystery, some sense of investigation. I wanted to know why a man in India would take and stick his body full of little spears and daggers and hooks. The only way to find out is to take some spears, daggers, and hooks and put them in your own body, which is the next thing I did. So I spent some years experimenting with everything I could find and out of this, I was finally beginning to develop a better relationship uh, between my psyche and my body. And I was learning a whole lot of things that ultimately led me to what I consider the most important thing about body modification and body explorations. It led me to a point where I could have a transformative experience of a kind you can't have any other way. So my experimentation went on and on. I saw uh, sadhus in India bending their bodies in contortions and staying in these for long periods of time. So I practiced and bent my body into contortions and held them for long periods of time. And uh, to my strange, uh, to my uh, to my surprise and delight, uh, once one starts these kinds of practices with the body, you develop a rapport with your body. You find out where spirit starts and the body stops, and vice versa. 
and you can learn to walk a fine line and lapse over into other altered states of consciousness where you may separate from your body or you may be in your body but instead of feeling what's in the body you are watching it as an observer you're not in, you're in the body but you're not just watching what goes on in the body and you can be in both places at the same time i was learning little uh tricks like that uh at the age of 12 this is 1942 uh, I believe the Germans were occupying this country at that time and they were bombing London. Um, I made my first pr permanent body piercing and I've been doing it ever since on myself and other people. Uh, my inspiration was a page from National Geographic magazine about 1936. It was a South Pacific man who was getting holes in his nostrils, pierced in his nostrils. And ooh, did I want to do that. That was intriguing. The next picture showed him with some tusks, or in, like I have in my nose. Uh, there were several problems about doing this where I lived and in South Dakota. First, there were no, no coconuts. What they did, they would take a green coconut and cut it into a circle with sharp points, and they would take the points and prop it open. They'd put it on the man's nose. They would knock the prop out, and the little points would poke together, and it said after some days, a hole would result. So I figured, well, that's the way you make a body piercing. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find any coconuts, and uh, to make it even worse, I couldn't sit in the choir loft of the Lutheran church with something clamped on my nose making a hole that would not be acceptable. So my next uh, op, uh, job was to find a place I could pierce. I was determined I was going to have a hole in my body that I made that this was going to transform me and make me into a different person. So I found the clothespins that I found so dear before and so available. I found the clamp clothespins. I put a little nail on one side and a little hole on the other side so the two would go together and the nail would go through the hole. Then I had to find a body part that people didn't acknowledge existed. In this culture um, and in this society and under the mores and the, and the rules by which they operated, uh, there was one body part that they never looked at and they never acknowledged that it existed and that was here. So I said, I'm going to pierce my penis. Nobody knows that it's there. Besides, I like it a lot anyway. So in secret and in private, I took the clothespin and I took my foreskin and found a place that I thought I wanted to have a ring. And I slipped the little clothespin clamp in there and let the thing go shut and ouch, it hurt. So I left it on. I said, well, if they can do it in the Pacific, I can do it here in South Dakota. And I left it on there for some hours. After a few minutes, it was just kind of a dull ache. And after a while, it was just kind of a buzz. And I just left it under, under some loose pants all day and into the night. And in the middle of the night, there was a strange feeling here, and I uh, turned the light on, went to the bathroom, and sure enough, the little nail had penetrated. I had made a piercing this way. And I had a ring ready, and I put it in there, and I had that piercing, and I still have it now. And the next Sunday, when I went and sat in the choir loft of the Lutheran Church, I felt great. I felt empowered. Nobody else out there had this. It started in earnest the night I lashed myself against the COVID wall. I was 17 then. I'd fasted for two days, reduced myself to an emaciated robot by dancing for hours with 50 pounds of logging chain wrapped around my legs, arms, and torso. I was seeking an experience no other person, human being I knew had ever had, even if it meant death. It was 2 a.m. I stood with my back against a cold wooden wall and laced ropes between fence staples driven in three-inch intervals uh, in the wall. I pulled the ropes deep into my legs from the ankles up to my numb, belted waist. Tied them tight, I felt helpless, glued against the wall. When my chest, my arms, and my head were also quite helpless, I just waited in the darkness, to st in the darkness not knowing what to expect. I was resolved to stay that way until something happened. My body ached for relief, for sleep. I had slept for two days, but it could not slip away because of the tight discomfort of the ropes. Soon, a warm, pleasant kind of numbness crept up my legs and arms. They dissolved into nothingness. But when the numbness also began to work up my spine into my breathing center, I panicked. I fought for breath. It was like drowning. Waves of terror passed through the parts of me that were still alive. 
A massive effort to free my arms from these ropes only resulted in a feeble creak. I was stuck. I was trapped, unable to loose myself, self-sentenced to whatever came next. And something deep inside suddenly shifted to a feeling of indifference. Oh well. I gave up fighting. I was just a watcher now, not aware of breathing or any other direct physical sensation. Only my head still seemed to exist. Next a vibration, an oscillation developed. It got stronger and stronger, not unpleasant in the beginning, but soon it felt like my robot body was suspended on the end of a long cable hanging into a deep chasm and a giant over whom I had no control was swinging that cable from wall to wall of the chasm and smashing me to pieces. The smashing went faster and faster and faster and got more violent with each swing. It was incredible. Years later, I found out I was experiencing my heartbeat firsthand. I was slowly, slowly in this condition, projecting fingernail by fingernail, cell by cell, finger by finger, slowly lifting out of my body. And these were the sensations I felt as it happened, very consciously. At an insane crescendo of this uncontrolled smashing, there was a faint click sound deep inside my head, an absolute stillness with a slight humming in the background. I was floating in a pool of warm, sticky glue, uncaring. I didn't know where I was, but I was alive, conscious, Disembodied, maybe, with, but with no fear, no pain, no discomfort. I was hyper alert and feeling good, satisfied, just like after the moment of sexual climax. Wow. I became aware that I could see, dimly, in a different sort of way than before. I concentrated my fuzzy vision. I was looking at me, or rather at my still lashed against the wall body. A part of me that thinks and feels and sees and hears and answers to a name was at least 10 feet from the wall. What was I looking at? Was it me or was I the looker? The utter reality of this paradox struck me with explosive force, but in this state of consciousness, I couldn't be serious. I explored this new reality for some time. One of the peculiarities was the feeling that in this state, there was no time. I knew I could go forward or backward in time as easily as I normally walk from one room to another. I studied the lifeless form on the wall. It was beautiful. I had feelings of great love for it. It was always obedient to my wishes, moving where and when I wanted it to, even when it was tired and in pain. Oh, I loved my body. Without this, how can I do these things? How can I feel these feelings? Then my attention moved away from that body on the wall I stayed in the present. The things to explore there were endless. I found I was still in a vague sort of body, but it wasn't physical. I walked, then lifted up slightly and floated around the cellar. I found I could move right through a concrete wall and into the earth outside, go right through the wall. Or I could just think light, and I would float up through the beams, floors, and roof of the house to hover above the trees. 